Welcome, friends. Welcome once again to New Life in Jesus, brought to you by the Emmanuel Christian Broadcasting Network. It is a joy and a privilege, as always, to bring the Word of God to you. And I'd like to read today from the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 6 to verse 10. Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 6 to verse 10. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. The Bible says a lot about grace. And today I want to focus on the aspect of this verse where the Lord said, Grace, grace to you. That is the title of this message. Grace, grace to you. Grace, what is the meaning of the word grace? It means unmerited favor or undeserved favor that a person can receive. In fact, in the word of God, in the Bible, grace is mentioned 125 times. 16 of the 21 epistles in the New Testament begins with the words, Grace be unto you. It is so profoundly significant. It is so important for us to understand. It is so difficult to understand the grace of God. Something we clearly do not deserve. Even though we may have surrendered our lives to God, even though we have turned aside our lives to Jesus, and He has given us this grace, it is something we cannot easily understand. In fact, the book of Ephesians talks about the riches of His grace. It talks about the glory of His grace. And in fact, the Bible teaches four kinds of grace. And I will tell you all of them, but I want to focus on one specific one today. It is an extremely important word to understand it, yet it is so difficult to comprehend it. Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 8 talks about saving grace. The verse says, for by grace are you saved and not by works. It is the gift of God. It talks about a saving grace. In other words, you don't become good to get close to God. You get close to God and you surrender your life to Jesus in order to become good. Grace is what saves us. That is the saving aspect of the grace of God. The saving grace. It saves us. It is the redeeming grace. And then you have the justifying grace. What is the difference? The Bible says by grace we are justified and thereby we have peace with God. Just if I'd. When you break that word down, it says just if I'd never sinned. Justified. Just if I had never sinned. It brings us to that place of standing with God. Just as if I had never sinned. There is a grace that when we have sinned and when we repent of that sin, God covers us with his blood and brings us to the place just as if I had never sinned. And then the Bible talks about the teaching grace of God. What is the teaching grace of God? Where can we find it? Titus chapter 2 verse 12 says, The grace of God has appeared unto men teaching us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, we should live righteously and godly in the present age. The teaching grace of God. It appeared unto men teaching us. When grace comes, it begins to teach us to begin to live and desire a holy and a consecrated life. If what, what we have today in our lives, my brother, my sister is not making us want to be more like Jesus, then it would only be a mere religion. If we are not constantly being transformed every day to be more like Jesus. 
In fact, Smith Wigglesworth said, if we are not progressing every day, then it means we are backsliding in some area of our lives. Grace will be, the teaching grace of God will change us. It will transform us. It will give us the power to walk away from what we used to be to what God wants us to be. My brother, my sister, as you're watching, God wants, uh, wants you to be someone according to his will. And the teaching grace will take us into that place where God wants us to be away from what, what we want to be ourselves that is the teaching grace of God it was admonishing the people it constantly renews the people it constantly um, teaches the people to live soberly righteously and godly the teaching grace of God then there is the fourth kind of grace which I'm talking to you today called the enabling grace of God the grace that enables us to do things for him Paul said three times I asked God to remove the thorn in my flesh. And three times God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. God did not remove the issue in his life. But God gave him the grace to overcome and to defeat the issue. That is the enabling grace of God. Sometimes God does miracles instantly. When we ask him, he may answer our prayer very quickly. Whereas we know that some prayers take slightly longer. And God's delays does not mean that he has denied us that prayer. But at other times when he pours, He will pour out his grace upon us to overcome obstacles as we go along. And that is the enabling grace of God that we find in this portion of Zechariah chapter 4. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The enabling grace of God, my brother, my sister, will help us to defeat mountains. And that's what exactly got hold of Zerubbabel. What was going on in this place, in Israel, in this chapter? When, the, when Zerubbabel went back to rebuild the walls of the city, we find that he begins with the temple. He goes first into the house of God. He didn't start with his house. He started with the house of God and laid the foundation by the grace of God. And we find here, the Bible says something interesting. It says... It was almost like instantly a mountain came up before him, spiritually speaking. And he, he starts having a conversation with these mountains. My brother, my sister, when we know Jesus as our personal savior, we need to start having conversations with mountains. We need to tell the mountain according to the word of God. Like the song we sing, go tell it to the mountain. We need to tell the mountain and stand strong in faith. So suddenly this mountain springs up and Zerubbabel says, Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall be a plain and you shall bring for, he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. The grace of God that helps us to overcome mountains. That, my brother, my sister, is the enabling grace of God. Whosoever, Jesus said, whosoever shall say in Mark 11 to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes the things that shall come to pass, he shall have whatever he says. Zerubbabel said, who are you, O mountain? Identify yourself. But by the time God is through with you, you shall be nothing. You shall be a smooth plain. The mountains will melt away. Today you may find that you are facing a frustrating mountain. You may find that you are facing a mountain that is too high to climb, too wide, too, too strong in your life. The forces of the enemy have put so many hurdles. You may find, but my brother, my sister, be of good cheer, for the Bible says the enabling grace of God is available for us to overcome mountains. 
You know, God never starts anything that he does not have the power to finish. He always starts something when he can finish it. It is up to us to trust him. It is up to us to get out of the way. You know what is the quickest way to get a miracle from God? It's to get out of the way with unbelief. It is to get our unbelief out of the way and to put our faith in God. Sometimes we have to hold on and not despise the day of small things and press on through enabling grace. The prophet comes to Zerubbabel and says to him, believe again, hope again, dream again. Maybe it seems like your life in, is in ruins. Maybe it seems like the city is, is, is shattered. The, the dreams have died. The hopes have gone. Maybe it seems like there is no way and this is the end of the road. But when you trust God, He shall make it like a smooth plane. That is the enabling grace of God. In fact, the prophet says something strange. Something they did not expect he says, he, he shall bring forth the capstone. The word capstone is another word for the headstone. In, it is the final stone in a building. This is where faith talks. You see, when, when, when fear is knocking on the door of your life, send faith to answer and no one will be there. If faith answers fear, no one will be there, my brother, my sister. Here we find that the city was in ruins. Here we find that the city had no hope. Here we find that the mountain was so big. Yet the word of the Lord says is, go and bring forth the capstone. What is the capstone? We have to understand this to know this, what he's talking about. The capstone is the headstone. Anytime a building is built, when it is dedicated unto the Lord or whoever the person they're dedicating it into, It'll have a headstone and that'll be like a plaque. It'll say this day this building has been dedicated and open to the public or whatever that the building has been dedicated to. That is the final stone after all of the building is completed. That is the stone which will be placed there. But here we find that the city is in ruins, that the house of the Lord is in ruins. Yet he's talking about the headstone. The headstone, the cornerstone of our lives. I get excited when I hear the word about the headstone. And all you, you find that the, the headstone is something that you place after the building is finished. And all this prophet has is a foundation with problems on the outside, problems on the inside. He is frustrated. Nothing was happening for 16 long years. And the prophet says, go and get the headstone, put it on the building site and say, grace, grace to it. The enabling grace of God. What a marvelous work it is. In a place which is ruined, in a place where there is no hope, in a place where there is utter destruction, he speaks a word of the Lord and puts the headstone. My brother, my sister, do you have the headstone over your defeats? Do you have the headstone over your circumstances? The headstone represents Jesus Christ. He is the stone the builders rejected, the Bible says. He is a stone that cried out on the cross. It is finished, the word of God says. If God started it, he will finish it. That is the enabling grace of God. The headstone of our lives, Jesus Christ and his plan of redemption was before the foundations of the world. What does that mean? That is profound. Even before you and I were born, even before you and I were formed in our mother's womb, even before all of that, he said grace, grace to it. He gave us this grace even before we were formed, even before this world was formed, the Bible says. The headstone of our lives. Without Jesus Christ, we cannot move anywhere. Without him and the, being the hope of our souls, we cannot speak into the ruins. An enabling grace will come from the headstone of our life into our situation. We can level every mountain with the enabling grace that comes upon us. Gee, he didn't whisper grace. Notice what happens. He says, shout grace. 
He didn't whisper. He says shout and it wasn't once. He said it twice. Grace, grace. When he started shouting grace, miracles began to happen. God made a way for the temple to be built. You will not be able to defeat the mountain in your life. And it may feel as though there is no way. But when you have the enabling grace and you have the headstone, when you have Jesus as Lord of your life and you say, shout to the mountain, God will move and nothing will be impossible with God. You know, we have to learn to be grace shouters, a people who shout grace. He is able to do, the Bible says, he's able to do exceedingly about all that we can ask or think. And today, if you face mountains of discouragement, if you face mountains of sickness, if you face mountains of strife and difficulties and trials and temptations, all you and I have to do is to take the headstone of our lives, Jesus Christ, and shout grace, grace into our situation. It is an affirmation of our faith in God. It is a confirmation of our, of our trust in God. It is our confirmation of our hope in God. Grace, grace to it. And the great spiritual metaphor or the understanding in this whole scripture of Zechariah chapter 4 is that you may be in the valley, you may be in the ruins, you may be feeling hopeless, you may be feeling that there is no, no, no circumstance where, where you can find a way out and your natural mind might not show you any solutions. And that is how Zerubbabel was. It was in ruins, but the Lord started with the capstone, the chief cornerstone, the headstone which the builders rejected. My brother, my sister, today I invite you to welcome Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. To make him the headstone, to make him the capstone, to, say, to, to taste of this enabling grace. You know, nothing you and I can do can, can get this grace of God. It's not something we can earn. If it is something we can earn, it is not called the grace of God. The grace of God is free. It is abundant, but it is for a limited time only. The Bible says that when Jesus comes back as a judge, when he, when he comes back to take us into his glory, the grace of God is only for this time. Today is this day of salvation. This is the cry of the Lord to, for us to repent and to believe in Him. And we will find that when we have this headstone in our life, the vision will start seeing again. The hope will start hoping again. The dream will start moving again. That is the enabling grace of God. You may have the teaching grace. You and I can taste of the saving grace, the redeeming grace of God. It is the enabling grace of God that will help us to move. It will help us to move from debt into plentiful. It will help us to move from disease into healing. It will ha help us to move from depression into freedom. It will help us to move from bondage and addiction into a greater place of His fullness in our life. The enabling grace of God that sets us free. The Bible says in John 1.17, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and faith came through Jesus Christ. So there, if it is very plain and very clear. If we want this enabling grace, this overcoming power to overcome the mountain that will help us to overcome, we need to know Jesus first. We need to know him as Lord and Savior first. We need to taste of his goodness. We need to say to him, Lord, enable me. Lord, help me. Lord, I surrender to you totally. I may have a secret sin that I have to surrender to you, Lord. When we say that, we will, we will receive his enabling grace in our life. My brother, my sister, the, the foundations of the temple in Jerusalem... Was, was laid bare for 16 long years. The prophets, the people of God were frustrated. But the word came saying, believe. Put the headstone, put the chief cornerstone and shout grace, grace to it. Are you willing to do that to impossible situations in your life?
today? Are you willing to invite Jesus? Are you willing to say, Lord, enough is enough. I am surrendering my life to you totally. I want you to be the chief cornerstone. I want you to be the headstone. I don't know who has rejected you and who has not, but I want to know you. I want to know you as my savior. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to be my hope, my ever-present help in my time of danger. The Bible says in Jeremiah 9, 23, 24, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But him who glories, let him glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That he understands and knows me. He wants us to know him. He wants us to go from a, from a step of unbelief and faith and being tossed about to knowing him. What's it like to know a person? Think about the person you know. When you know a person, you know their behavior. You know their wants. You know their desires. You know how, how much you can trust them. My beloved friends, Jesus wants you to know him. He wants you to know him in despair. He wants you to know him in the good times, just as in the bad times. He wants you to know him in the mountains. He wants you to know him in the valley. Are you willing to know him today? There is hope for you and for me. There is peace for you and for me when we know him. When we know him in our sorrows. When we know him in our difficulties, in trials, when we know him. You know, it's sometimes easy for people to, to for us to reach out to God in our difficult times and forget about him in good times. But he wants us to know him at all times. He wants us to, to trust in him and make him the cornerstone of our life, the compass of our souls on which we stand, the one in whom we believe, the one in whom we trust. He wants us this to be a personal time. Zerubbabel just turned around and he said, Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. You shall be nothing. My brother, my sister, the greatest thing in the word of God is that Jesus loves you. He loves you with an eternal love. He loves you and wants to give you his peace. The mountains will melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. It is not the trials that is important. It is the test in your life that Jesus will turn into a testimony. If you will give, his, give, give him your heart in the midst of your test, he will make it a testimony. If you will give him your trial, he will make you triumphant. If you will, he, will, he will take you from being defeated into being victorious. My brother, my sister, be of good cheer. Trust him, know him, love him and serve him. In every area of your life and in my life, we will begin to see that just like Zerubbabel declared, the enabling grace of God will envelop our lives. It will envelop our homes, our families. It will envelop everything concerning our lives, the enabling grace of God. God doesn't have to do it the way the world does it. He doesn't have to open doors the way the world does it. If one door is shut, he will create another door. If one way is lost, he will make another way. He is the burden bearer of our souls. He is the way maker of our lives. The Bible refers to him as the one who opens doors. The Bible refers to him as the fourth man in the fire, as the lion of Judah. It refers to him as the bright and morning star. How will it be, my brother, my sister, if we do not know this God? How will it be if we do not know this Savior? I invite you today. I challenge you today. You don't have to say any long prayers. You don't have to do any, any big pilgrimages. All you have to say is, Lord Jesus, I want this enabling grace in my life. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Be the Lord of my life from today. I surrender it all to you. That's all it takes, my brother, my sister. And I challenge you, your life will never be the same again. Mountains will melt. Trials will move away. In everything, you will be able to say grace, grace to it. So this time as we pray, I invite those who do not know the Lord as their personal savior to, to open their hearts and to invite him.
Let us pray. Lord, our loving Heavenly Father, this evening, this day, we thank you. We thank you tonight, to today, that your grace is upon our lives. And we can say grace, grace unto it. For those of us, Lord, who are considering to opening our hearts to you, help us, Lord. We open our hearts to you. We rejoice in you, knowing that heaven rejoices as people are giving their lives to you, Lord. Lord, wherever we are watching on the internet, on the TV, wherever, Lord, in our homes, in wherever we are, help us to have this enabling grace. Help us to surrender, open our hearts. Thank you for healing and delivering us at this time. In Jesus' name, I ask and pray. Amen. Lord, we, we thank you. And my brother, my sister, if you have surrendered your lives to God, to Jesus as Lord and Savior, write to us, email us, give us a call. We rejoice with you. And if you need prayer, ring us on the numbers on, on the screen. Till we meet again next time on New Life in Jesus, God bless you and keep you. Thank you.